Assalamu alaikum and hello everyone. Welcome to this channel. Today we are going to talk about fever, one of the commonest complaints that you may encounter. Each symptom warrants different approach. In previous video, we describe and differentiate the types of chest pain in terms of its sites, onset character, radiation, alleviating factor, timing, exacerbating factors, and severity. The Socrates. I'm sure you are very familiar with this mnemonic. But in this video, we will see that this approach may not be relevant to some symptoms such as fever. So the format of this presentation will be a little bit different. We'll look into the definition and pathophysiology of fever first so that we can appreciate the nature of this symptom before we explore the causes of fever, some classifications or type of fever that will help us with our diagnosis, the associated symptoms and signs, and lastly, we'll look into some causes of hyperpyrexia, which are totally different from fever or pyrexia. These are my references for this topic. Let us begin. The normal body temperature is around 36 to 37.2 degrees Celsius, measured orally in the early morning. It has diurnal variation around 0.5 to 1 degree Celsius. The lowest recording is usually in the early morning and highest in late afternoon. So fever is any temperature above 37.2 if you measure it in the early morning orally or more than 37.8 degree at any other time of the day. You can measure temperature orally or through other ways such as axillary, rectal, vaginal or tympanic. But there are differences. For example, the oral measurement is actually 0.5 degrees Celsius lower than the body core temperature. Axillary is 0.5 degree less than oral or 1 degree less than the body core temperature, while rectal, vaginal, and tympanic reflects the actual body core temperature. Hypothermia or hypopyrexia is worthy of a different category because as we will see later, the temperature above 41 degree may point to other differential diagnosis. Next is pathophysiology. We can summarize the development of fever into three stages. We have the stimuli, specifically called the pyrogens, which will cause the release of inflammatory mediators that have some effects on our body, either locally or systematically. And fever is happened to be one of those systemic effects. Let's start with pyrogens. It can be divided into those which are exogenous, simply means that they are from outside of our body, and those which are endogenous, or things which are already inside of our body. Exogenous, for example, are bacteria, virus, fungal, and parasite. Endogenous, for example, are substances which are released from necrotic or injured cells, substances which are never exposed to our immune system because they are located intracellularly. Or it can simply be due to substances which are released by just normal cells, such as seen in autoimmune disease. These stimuli will initiate the release of inflammatory mediators. We have lots of types. Robin's pathology highlighted eight of them which are histamine, leukotrienes, prostaglandin, platelet activating factor, kinins, chemokines, cytokines, and complement factors. Pyrogens will initiate the release of some prostaglandins and cytokines specifically. The same stimuli may also initiate the release of other inflammatory mediators, but the ones that are responsible for fever are these two in red. These two will cause the hypothalamus, which act as the body thermostat, to readjust the body temperature to a higher degree, hence we have fever. But we need to understand that fever is part of the systemic effects of these mediators. The summary of all systemic effects of the above mediators can physically manifest as symptoms and signs or identified through laboratory investigation. Some symptoms may not be a direct consequence of inflammatory mediators. For example, we know that fever is caused by cytokines and prostaglandin. But when the hypothalamus readjusts the baseline temperature to a higher degree, the body will try to generate more heat and at the same time, try to reduce heat loss to the surroundings so that the body temperature will raise to the new point set by the hypothalamus. One of the ways is to generate heat by involuntary shiverings or rigors and to reduce heat loss, the vessels vasoconstrict so that it is furthest away from the skin surface. This will cause chills or cool sensation which will then make us search for warmth, for example, wrapping our body under a blanket to further prevent more heat loss. Vasoconstriction also will cause decreased sweating. 
pooling of the blood from superficial to deep vessels means more blood now is circulating in major vessels. Thus, we will also have increase in pulse rate and blood pressure. So that is how fever and the following symptoms and signs are related. But the inflammatory mediators may also have other redundant functions with other different mediators as well. For example, pain is mediated by prostaglandin and kinins but not cytokines. Malaise and anorexia are always associated with fever because these symptoms are mediated by cytokines. In chronic inflammation, where cytokines is always in high amount for a long time in the body, we may see signs of cachexia in patient, for example, in patient with cancer. Swelling or rashes are also part of systemic effects. This happens when there is vasodilation, which is caused by histamine and prostaglandin, and increased vascular permeability, which can be caused by histamine, leukotrienes, or complement proteins. Other manifestations that you may encounter with fever are in laboratory investigation. Increased acute phase proteins such as CRP, fibrinogen, serum amyloid proteins, and hepcidins are triggered by cytokines. Changes in white cell count, either leukocytosis or leukopenia, are also caused by cytokines as well. All of these are some of the major systemic effects of inflammation. But before we proceed, we have to keep in mind that not all mediators are released in inflammation because that will depend on the trigger. And if a patient has fever which is due to cytokines, that does not necessarily mean other cytokines mediated changes will manifest as well because there are just a lot of subtype of cytokines which we know have different actions and triggers as well. Alright, let's look at the causes of fever. A common mistake is to assume that fever is only caused by infection. As we have seen previously, anything that may trigger cytokine or prostaglandin release may cause fever. In fact, we may list the causes of fever for each group of disease, either the disease is vascular in origin, infectious, traumatic, autoimmune, metabolic, idiopathic, cancerous or neoplastic, or due to drugs. Deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism are the examples for vascular disease. Blood thrombus are considered foreign by our immune cells because they are not supposed to form in our blood vessels. This is an example of endogenous pyrogen. Any viral, bacterial or fungal infection can also cause fever because they are exogenous pyrogen. Fat embolism or crush syndrome are common complications of fracture in trauma. In fat embolism, the yellow marrow in long bone is dislodged to other parts of the body, so it is considered foreign by our immune system as well. SLE and systemic sclerosis are examples from autoimmune disease. In SLE, for example, the intracellular content from dying cells are exposed instead of being completely phagocytized by the macrophages. This results in immunogenic reaction towards the intracellular content such as double-stranded DNA and nuclear proteins. We also have gout for metabolic. Here, the urate in blood are crystallized and deposited in the joints, so the immune cells will react to it because it is not supposed to be there. Lymphoma is a common cause of fever among cancer. In theory, any cancer can cause fever because these cells may have mutated to a certain extent that it may be seen as foreign by our immune cells. Drug consumption are other examples of exogenous spirogens other than infection. The common ones are listed here. Let's move on to the classification of fever. Fever can be classified in terms of their pattern and duration. Both classification are useful to help us formulate our differential diagnosis. There are five patterns of fever. Continuous, intermittent, remittent, relapsing, and undulant. These five can be differentiated by asking four simple questions. For how long the fever spikes, for how long it declines, and if it declines, does it decline to normal body temperature, and does the fever recur or spikes again? For continuous or persistent fever, the temperature rises for an amount of days before it declines back to normal body temperature and it maintains after that, meaning the body temperature does not rise again, such as depicted in this graph. This is commonly seen in self-limiting viral illness, for example influenza or common cold, and typhoid fever caused by some species of salmonella. 
However, for typhoid fever, not only that it is persistent, it also has a very distinguished pattern called step ladder pattern. Some author may classify this into a different type of fever. Next is intermittent fever. In this type of fever, the temperature rises for a few hours each day before it declines back to normal in the same day. It may rise back again within the same day or the next day. There are lots of examples for this. Most pyogenic bacterial infections show this pattern. Others include cytomegalovirus infection, lymphoma, pseudomonas infection, gonococcal and leishmaniasis. To elaborate more on this, not only that they occur daily, but some organism tends to cause fever spikes during different hours of the day. For example, pseudomonas infection tends to cause morning spikes. Cytomegalovirus infection causes afternoon spikes, while evening spikes are suggestive of pyogenic infection. If the spikes occur once daily, it can also be described as quotidian fever. This graph actually shows intermittent and quotidian pattern. Two fever spikes in a day are called double quotidian fever. This type of fever is seen in gonococcal endocarditis and visceral leishmaniasis. Double quotidian pattern may show something like this. The third one is called remittent fever. It is almost similar to intermittent fever except that the body temperature never actually declined to normal body temperature. This is also seen in pyogenic infection, but more specifically when there is already pus collection, for example in empyema of gallbladder or pelvic abscess. The fourth one is called relapsing fever. In this type, the temperature rises for a variable period before it declines to normal for a certain amount of days and rises back again later. Fever in malaria is a classical example for this type of pattern. Malaria, if caused by Plasmodium vivax, shows tertian fever. That is, there will be one day duration of fever followed by two days duration of normal body temperature before the fever starts again, such as seen in this graph. Malaria, if caused by Plasmodium malariae, will show quartan fever. So the patient will experience a day of fever followed by three days of normal body temperature before it spikes again. Alright, the last type is undulant pattern. This fever pattern is usually seen in chronic disease. The temperature rises for a few days following continuous or remittent pattern before it declines to normal for a certain amount of days. Then, the fever will recur again following the same pattern. Examples of disease following this pattern are Hodgkin lymphoma and brucellosis. Fever in Hodgkin lymphoma is also known as Pell Epstein fever. In this type, there will be alternating 3 to 10 days duration of fever, followed by 3 to 10 days duration of no fever. This graph here shows undulin with continuous pattern, whereas undulin with remittent pattern looks something like this. The second useful classification is in terms of duration of fever. We can divide them into three. The first one is duration of fever 3 days or lesser. The second is duration of fever more than 3 days up to 14 days. And the last one is fever of undetermined or unknown origin. Fever less than 3 days are due to self-limiting viral illness. This includes for example common cold. More than 3 days are usually due to bacterial infection. The common diseases according to each system are as follows. It can also be caused by some viral disease such as dengue which lasts for 5 days and acute hepatitis. Fever of undetermined origin is defined when the causes of fever is not known after one week of intensive study both clinically and through laboratory means. Example of this would be when the patient is admitted to hospital for further investigation. However, the cause of fever is still not known after a week spent investigating. It is also called fever of unknown origin if the fever lasts more than 3 weeks without intensive study. Some clinicians took 2 weeks as cut-off point. It may be different according to which reference you use. For this, we have to consider other causes of infection, non-infective causes such as malignancy and autoimmune disease. And let's put the last group as others. Infective causes can be divided into bacterial, viral, and parasitic infection. 
For bacterial infection, we have tuberculosis, an infection caused by other zoonotic bacteria such as typhoid fever, leptospirosis, cytokosis, brucellosis, and borreliosis. If you notice, the disease listed here are special because the name of the disease are derived from the organism's name rather than taken from a specific organ's name, as we have seen in the previous category. That perhaps will help you to remember. The group of viral infection here are usually associated with immunodeficient or immunocompromised patients, such as Epstein-Barr, cytomegalovirus, and HIV virus. Examples of parasitic infection include malaria, amebiasis, and toxoplasmosis. Common example for malignancy are leukemia and lymphoma, although other malignancy can cause fever as well. Common autoimmune disorders are connective tissue disease such as SLE and rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and sarcoidosis. For others, we have hyperthyroidism, factitious fever, and some percentage of fever just remains to be of unknown cause. Keep in mind that infection still constitutes 40% of causes of pyrexia of unknown origin, 30%, 20%, and 10% respectively going down the category. However, the longer the duration of fever, the less likely the cause of fever to be infectious. Only 6% of chronic on and off fever more than 6 months are due to infection. Alright. Next, we will talk about the associated symptoms. We have seen how some symptoms are related to fever based on its pathophysiology. But for this part, we will be highlighting certain symptoms which are considered as red flag pointers. That means these symptoms usually are related to disease which are left threatening or requires urgent intervention. If these symptoms present in patients, we need to be more careful take into consideration the differential diagnoses that are associated with each symptoms down the list. The first one is sweating. This is one of the mechanisms through which heat are lost to the surrounding. After a fever, the hypothalamus resets the body temperature to normal again. Sweating allows heat to dissipate out from the body to lower down the body temperature. That being said, this is actually a normal physiological phenomenon following a fever, and patients should feel well again after that. However, if this occurs every night, followed by a similar fever the next day, this may suggest an on and off fever pattern where the body temperature fluctuates extremely, such as seen in intermittent, remittent, and relapsing fever. This is further supported by complaint of drenching night sweats that soaks clothing or bad clothing, unlike a typical sweat. That means the body tries to lose a lot of heat from an extreme temperature gap within a day. This is commonly seen in fever caused by infections such as tuberculosis, HIV and mononucleosis, and lymphoma for malignancy. Other cases that are not associated with fever are nocturnal hypoglycemia in patients with diabetes mellitus, or substance abuse such as use of heroin. Next one is chills and rigor. We have seen how both symptoms are related to fever when we learned about the pathophysiology earlier. Chills simply means cold sensation that makes a search for warmth. This is commonly associated with viral infection. In fact, actually these occur in almost all fever as part of the physiological changes following fever. And rigor is the act of shivering. However, Professor Morta in his book further explains that true chills and rigor are those which fit some certain criteria. For example, teeth chattering and bed shaking, which cannot be stopped voluntarily, absence of sweating, cold and pale extremities and dry mouth. These manifestations show extreme measures taken by the body to conserve body heat so as to increase the body temperature. Hence, these symptoms are usually associated with high-grade fever. This is commonly seen in septicemia, pyogenic infection with bacteremia, and visceral abscess. Malignancies such as lymphoma may also show these symptoms as well. Other red flag symptoms are severe myalgia, unexplained rash, or severe odinophagia. 
Severe myalgia is also associated with sepsis. Rashes are seen in dengue or leptospirosis. Severe odinophagia is suggestive of acute epiglottitis, commonly among children. We also have red flag signs, such as altered mental state or confusion, marked pallor, tachycardia, tachypnea, and jaundice. Altered mental state may suggest CNS infection or sepsis. Pallor, tachycardia, and tachypnea may suggest septic shock. Although septic shock is a type of distributive shock, we may not see warm peripheries here, such as seen in neurogenic shock, because vasoconstriction is partly how the body conserves the heat to increase body temperature. Jaundice may suggest organ failure following septic shock or other causes such as leptospirosis. Other than red flag pointers, we also need to know some nature of fever in children and elderly, which are somewhat different from others. Fever above 38.5 degrees Celsius in children warrants close scrutiny because the temperature above 41 degrees is especially harmful to them. Fever unlikely to go beyond 41 degrees unless in CNS infection or in careless acts such as shutting them in a car for long hours in a hot day or overwrapping a febrile child. Extreme temperature may cause dehydration or febrile seizure among children. Elderly has somewhat impaired thermoregulation, so any grades of fever is significant. They are also more vulnerable to hypothermia and hypothermia, so it is safer to assume sepsis in elderly with fever until proven otherwise. For the last component of this video, we are going to talk about some causes of hyperpyrexia, which are heat stroke, malignant hypothermia, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, and factitious fever. Heat stroke happens when our normal thermoregulatory system fails after prolonged exposure to heat, meaning our body can no longer dissipate heat out of the body by sweating when the body temperature rises, so the body temperature will keep on rising. This is probably because it needs to conserve body water, which is need to maintain the blood circulation. Features suggestive of heat stroke are hyperpyrexia with hot, flushed, but dry skin with rapid pulse initially. These are followed by circulatory collapse when the body is too dehydrated, so the blood pressure will drop and patient may show altered conscious state. Malignant hypothermia is a rare hereditary disorder. This is commonly highlighted in anesthesiology because patients with this disorder shows abnormal response to general anesthetic drugs such as succinylcholine. It is characterized by sudden surge in body temperature associated with muscular rigidity such as mesenteric spasm or worse than that. This is also accompanied by acidosis because the respiratory muscles are in spasm. Monitoring equipment may show tachycardia, tachypnea, and increasing antidal carbon dioxide. Urine investigation of myoglobinuria is also seen. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome is commonly highlighted in psychiatry. This is rare but potentially lethal reaction to antipsychotic drugs such as haloperidol or lithium carbonate. The features may mimic those seen in malignant hypothermia. And the last one is factitious fever, which happens in case of malingering. The thermometer may record high temperature because it is dipped in warm water or rubbed against bed sheet or shirts. We may suspect factitious fever when hyperpyrexia is not accompanied by warm skin, tachycardia, flushed skin, sweating, or absence of diurnal variation when a series of measurements are taken throughout the day. Alright, that's it for approach to fever. If you find this video to be helpful, hit the like button and share them with your colleagues. Subscribe for future videos. Thank you for watching. Bye bye.